Hey everybody, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today we're talking to Forrester's Principal Analyst for Customer Experience, Pete Jock, PhD. Pete's responsibility is to serve customer experience professionals, advise clients on customer experience measurement, something all of you are interested in, and he helps clients build stronger customer loyalty and better business outcomes through higher quality customer experiences. He holds a doctorate in industrial and organizational psychology from the University of Connecticut. Pete's career spans 25 years in customer experience and consumer insights roles with Fortune 100 companies, including Lincoln Financial Group, Cigna, and Mass Mutual. Today, we are talking about Forrester's 2024 planning guide that all of you in customer experience need to be hearing about because we're going to be talking about budgets, ROI, metrics, data, and so much more. Please enjoy Pete Jocks. Pete, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. Are you in Boston today? I'm outside of Boston in Western Massachusetts. Oh, wonderful. Well, I am so excited to have you here. Forrester has such a long tradition and history of being a leader, a leading thought leadership um, production company in a way um, that just every everyone in our space just really relies on. And, you know, with so much uncertainty, the report that you guys have just come out with, I think is really, really relevant. But before we get into that, let's talk about you and your background. You were in insurance, you've been a practitioner, a change agent. Can you just talk about some of the highlights of your career trajectory and how you landed at Forrester? Sure. Um, so a little bit of a convoluted uh, path. You uh, probably saw my bio. I have a degree in industrial organizational psychology. So I actually started out as an organizational development consultant uh, in, outside of Boston. And due to primarily some life choices, uh, shortly after getting married, moved back to Western Massachusetts, where it was a little bit more difficult to find a job in that space, just not quite as many firms located uh, in Western Mass. So I started looking for uh, other jobs that had similar skill sets, and I actually landed in market research and spent the first part of my career, and actually most of my career, very much focused in customer satisfaction research, probably before we even called it customer experience. Um, So I started out at a a regional HMO, um, moved up to a large uh, area hospital, and from there actually got into the insurance industry through a trade association that did a lot of research, and then we would publish it, similar to Forrester, publish it and uh, speak at conferences and work with clients on uh, uh, bringing forth what what those insights meant. Um, Reached a point where, having worked in the trade association for a while, some of the feedback that we would sometimes get is, yeah, well, yeah, this is interesting, but you guys don't, you know, you're you're missing some of what's really going on in the business. So I decided I'm going to go into the business and learn that side of it, you know, get really get the practitioner side. Uh, So that's when I got into first working at Mass Mutual for a number of years, working on VOC and again, uh, market insights work. Moved over to Cigna for a while, uh, again, managing VOC, getting into design work, journey mapping, and some of the other great tools that we use in customer experience. Um, Subsequently, back into the life insurance space and annuity space with Lincoln Financial. And as I kind of continued progressing and gaining a broader set of skills uh, on the Lincoln side, I worked in in the strategy team. We were part of the strategy team, which was really exciting because it was a much more direct uh, line to leadership to talk about about customers to talk about insights and have that uh, incorporated into the decision making. Uh, but I remembered my my work at that trade association and realized how much I enjoyed doing the research and talking to folks about it. Kind of a little bit of, of a mix of the consulting and uh, I'll say kind of academic side. And I was familiar with Forrester, having been a client of theirs for a number of years, and started for looking looking for opportunities to uh, reconnect with and, and take on that type of role. So that's how. I ended up at Forrester and am loving the work. It probably gives you really unique insight because you have actually been a practitioner. And I think when, you, when you've when you been a practitioner and you know how hard this job is, it really changes your perspective. Let's talk about some of the key trends you're seeing. Um, personally, from, from my view, it feels like, and we've both been in this industry a long time, customer experience has up-leveled from the contact center to the boardroom. 
And it just seems like more leaders outside of what you would traditionally think about as a customer experience practitioner are interested in this topic. Would you agree that the the field has up leveled to the boardroom, to the CEO office? I would say yes. It's certainly in many cases getting the attention. We see in some cases companies are starting to include mention of customer metrics in investor calls. Certainly we see them in annual reports, uh, things like that. So it's, it's getting the attention. But I think at the same time, it's creating a new challenge or an increasing challenge for CX leaders that – Now they've got that spotlight, they've got that seat at the table that they've been asking for for many organizations. And now, you know, you mentioned trends. We're seeing uh, a bit of a shift now in the change in the quality, the level of quality of of what customers are reporting back to us uh, about their experiences. And certainly we know, as you saw in the planning report, that we're fighting more uh, economic challenges. And so it's putting the CX leader now in in a more difficult space that they either may not have been before anticipated that this was someday coming, maybe came sooner, that they're being challenged about, hey, you know, we've we've seen this as important. We've allocated budget. We've allocated resources. But we're seeing these scores shift. We're seeing maybe not the level of progress that we may have hoped for. And so they're being challenged more. And I think this is a very critical time for these leaders to really uh, be able to demonstrate their value work at uh, being able to more closely link to ROI. So what is going on, Pete? Like during COVID, we all blame quiet quitting. I've read that actually quiet quitting is not why service is so bad. It's actually because companies treat their front line employees so bad, they don't pay them enough, they don't retain them, they're not valued, and so they quit. It's not because they want to quit, it's because they're not appreciated at work. That's something I heard. Um, Like what, from your perspective, why is service so bad across the board right now? So you know, it's it's hard to put into one specific uh, situation or, or example, but one of the things we did see quite a bit of are companies that had changed the way they were providing service during COVID, you know, a lot of the drive up services, maybe some improvements in door to door delivery. And as we moved out of COVID, there were some companies that decided we need to we're going to pull back now. We don't need to provide that level of service or that type of service anymore because people are coming in into, into the stores more often or coming into the restaurants. And what had happened is, is consumers had raised their expectation or it had had leveled up their expectation that now they're questioning you were able to provide this service before. Why are you taking it away? We liked it. That became kind of the norm. And again, for many, for some, for some companies, they're they're moving back or they're letting up on the gas a bit and saying, okay, we don't need to worry about that as much anymore. Let's go focus on this other thing. And and what do you think? You think that's a good idea? Um, I mean, certainly it varies by uh, by industry in terms of the impact, but um, no, I mean, we need to keep thinking about where those customer expectations are going. You know, we commonly talk about how. Other industries, you know, for uh, brands looking outside of their own industry to learn what's driving that disruption. What are comp- what are consumers now seeing offered by new uh, disruptive companies that they need to think about to catch up on? So certainly, you know, huge shift to digital. Uh, but what what comes with that shift too is also a change in how customers engage with the firm. Uh, so going back to the call center, you know, certainly that the shift is. Um, moving more simple do-it-yourself types of activities to online, to engaging with chat, to you know get a digital uh, engagement, which de- decreases costs. And for a certain proportion of consumers, that's fine. But two things come up: we have a, a, a group of consumers, typically older, who are are more comfortable with uh, either direct face-to-face or phone engagements, that are saying, "Well, you know, my preference really is to pick up the phone and talk to somebody and walk me through this issue." Um, the other issue is that now as all these simple tasks are being managed by digital channels, it's making more complex tasks the ones that are arriving in the call centers. Mm -hmm. And in a way, this kind of loops back to to your quiet quitting comment that are those uh, agents skilled enough to be able to handle those much more complex uh, challenges? You know, are issues being resolved as quickly as some of those simpler ones were earlier? Do they have the tools that they need? You know, and it raises a whole uh, different set of questions that companies might not be ready for or aren't keeping in pace with uh, as that shift happens in the call centers. 
Absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it's a very frustrating time, I think, for contact center leaders who seems like from your report, they just don't have what they need all the time to be able to serve the customer in the way that they, they want. Let's focus on the report for a bit, the planning guide 2024. What are some of the key findings from the report, especially around money, budget, and what can you share with our listeners? Sure. So one of the things we we draw uh, from for this report are some surveys that we field pretty uh, you know in, in in the middle of the year, as companies are starting to think about what their budgets are going to look like. So we get that initial read on what CX leaders are anticipating, and we do see about two thirds anticipate an increase in their budgets. And and I'll be honest, there's there's some of us that still think, well, okay, is that really going to happen? We're we're hopeful that that happens. One of the um, positive aspects was that that number was um, much more tempered and what we feel realistic than we saw in last year's report, um, that we were just starting to see some of that economic burden. We were still dealing with supply chain issues and inflation was running hot and heavy. And we were kind of thinking, really, you're expecting that big of a, of a budget increase. So this year, again, two thirds saying they're going to be, they'll see they're expecting an increase, but much less, probably like around 10% or so, as opposed to, again, last year we saw more in the 20, 30 percent increases. Um, there's a small proportion, around 20 percent, that expect, um, or actually I think it's less than that. It's, uh, yeah, well, 16 percent saying uh, a, a decrease in their budgets, and then the remaining 20 percent saying level. So the numbers there are feel, you know, I'll say feel good. Um, you know, they, they seem realistic and they're hopeful for CX teams, but there's still uh, a big need to be more effective, efficient with budgets. And that's probably kind of the next big theme is that what we're guiding uh, brands to think about, what companies to think about is to really be more effective and impactful with their budgets. Uh, one major area that we're, you know, that kind of cuts across a couple different themes of, you know, where to invest, where to, uh, where to cut is this idea of, of taking more action with what you have uh, and not worrying so much about continuing to just gather more data and more data. So um, finding the tools, finding the resources to now look at the data that you have, find connections between those data that drive the insights or drive action that helps you make decisions to say, this is what we're going to do to fix this experience, or this is what we're going to do next to continue improving our experience. Um, again, a lot of companies kind of get stuck in that almost analysis paralysis that they have all this data. They may come up with scores and figures, but they're not taking it that final step as well as they can be to say, what are we going to do next? What decision are we supporting with it? So you said, just to reiterate and ensure that, that every everyone listening to the podcast understands what you're saying, I read in the report that 64% of U.S. customer experience leaders anticipate increased budget for 2024. Can you confirm that? Yes, that's the number that we have. Okay. That we've, that we've published, yep. One of the things that I've noticed that customer experience leaders really struggle with is their ability to to show that they are making the company money or saving the company money. They are not great at connecting the dots as far as ROI. Is that something that you've been exploring with clients or in your report to be able to show like the customer experience programs that we have are so important to either increasing sales, reducing churn, um, and really do matter to the bottom line? Yeah, that's a lot of the conversations that I have with clients. You know, my, my area of focus is in CX measurement, and part of that is helping them make the linkages between different types of metrics to ROI, to what we generally call a business outcome. And in some situations, that question is really challenging them to think about what is the best and most appropriate business outcome to align your CX metric to. So, you know, you, you mentioned revenue, and that's usually the first place that people go to. Nothing wrong with that. Part of it is asking your leadership, looking at your strategy documents and saying, what is our plan for increasing revenue? Is it increasing uh, market share? Is it increasing share of wallet? And let's look at what we're asking our customers. If it's, hey, how satisfied are you with the experience? It's, it's a good uh, beacon metric, good overall metric, but it tends to be less correlated with some of those uh, uh, business outcomes. When we look at something like NPS, uh, Net Promoter Score, which is a measure of how likely are you to recommend, it's a proxy for loyalty. It does have um, a closer connection to revenue. 
But what sometimes the conversation, conversation I have with clients is we're not finding that connection. What do we do? Well, and so sometimes it's- Let me stop you there. So, so the customers are saying um, how, yes, we would recommend you to a friend, but then what happens for the business? What fault, what's missing from the data? So what they're well, what's missing is you know there's they're, the company when they're doing the analysis is not seeing uh, a correlation or a relationship that you know this customer who said they they would be willing to recommend we don't see perhaps a big lift in their uh, you know what they're willing to spend or um, if we're looking across a set of customers so one thing to do is to look a little bit more deeply at the data for example with NPS oftentimes that analysis stops at promoter passive detractor. Let's look at the whole scale and correlate that against revenue. Maybe you see something different. In one example, working with a bank, um, they, were they were trying to correlate it to deposits. And as we talked through it, we realized that you know, for uh, less affluent customers, the amount of deposits they can continue to bring in on a weekly basis are much smaller. They just don't have the resources, whereas a more affluent customer does. So if we look at the whole customer base together, we lose that, you know, uh, the, the relationship we might find if we look just at mass market versus looking at affluent customers. And in fact, when they went back and they broke the data up that way, they did see a stronger relationship between that willingness to recommend and then the amount of uh, additional deposits or assets they were bringing into the account. So again, the recommendation there is, is don't stop at that first step and say, oh, there's no relationship here. You may need to dig in a little bit. Another thing to consider is, are you asking the right or the best question for that CX beacon metric? Uh, perfect example is in the health insurance space. We see a lot of companies now that don't see the relationship between NPS and um, a metric they may have on a uh, um, number of members or, or, or a number of uh, you know, the, the premium dollars they have coming in. And when we talk to consumers, when we talk to companies, what we find is that consumers are saying, well, I don't recommend my health plan. I don't know what my neighbor has access to. So it doesn't make sense. Or it's a very personal decision. Or you know, just the way they're interpreting the question is different than what you might want them to be thinking about when they're answering it. So we suggest what you know what might be a better question. Maybe it's how likely are you to talk positively about us to your employer, because it's the employer that ultimately makes a decision. Do you think that that executives really should depend so much on this quantitative research when the the data can be unclear? When if these executives were actually just to go and talk to customers, the qualitative research that you actually might get more valuable data. Well, you get different kinds of data. With the qualitative, you certainly get a lot of rich information on what, you know, what might need to be changed. Why are they rating us certain ways? But the, the quantitative, the survey data has value because you're, you know, you're in essence getting a sense of how large this problem is. It's helping with prioritization decision making. So let's say we're asking folks at a high level, at a relationship level, please rate us on how well we do on these major attributes of service and, and the product. And we can go back and we can look at the pattern of scores and say, you know what, we look at how they answer these questions and, and their overall satisfaction or uh, our NPS or, or effort, we can see that uh, our willing, the ability for, me to, for the company to communicate clearly to me is one of the most important drivers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we see that in our data. So that helps the organization prioritize. But now, to your point, when we, when we then ask the question, well, what do we need to do to improve that communication? What do customers mean by that? Then we can turn to the qualitative data. We can turn to unstructured data from call center notes, from social media, from a number of different sources to help the organization understand, oh, this is what we need to fix. This is how we do it. You know, one of the things that I've heard people talk about, like the former CXO of Lyft, you know, she said one of the best metrics, instead of looking at MPS, which we can't always rely on, is could be, did the customer call back to the contact center? Like they didn't get their problem solved. You're going to see usage go up. Um, I mean, outside of NPS, is there a better way to gauge, like, are we doing a good job in the contact center when NPS is not always reliable? So the, you know, a couple of questions, a couple of paths there is, yeah, to look at 
uh, perhaps a more appropriate high-level question. And when you're talking about now the contact center, where we're thinking about a different level of measurement, we could be talking about a very specific point in time. You know, I want to ask you about when you just called in and talked to Chris uh, and rate us on you know five questions, which is kind of a very specific touch point. We could ask a survey. We could ask questions about a more a more broader journey. Like you've you've contacted us because we have you have a question about a claim or you have a, a dispute about a product. So let's ask you about all the steps in that because it may include more than just a call center. Maybe that started at the website, and we want to understand those handoffs between channels. Mm -hmm. So the overall kind of question that you're asking, you're right. Maybe, maybe it's not NPS. Maybe it's something as simple as, were you able to accomplish what you needed to in this call? Um, and, and the other thing, I'll, I'll kind of extend to that because – Ultimately, what we'd really like to see, and, th and this came out in the in the report, the uh, planning report as well, is the opportunity to reduce the number of surveys over time. Because what you can do is, let's say you have NPS, you have that question, you start looking at the patterns between responses on that question and some of your operational data that you have. You use that to understand what actually happened in a call or on a website that led to a low score, a high score. And you, you, you model that, you use a predictive ability of those internal metrics. You, know, you start realizing that, boy, whenever we saw this happen, it led to a bad outcome. So now you can focus on those internal metrics and recognize, uh-oh, this just happened. It means we're probably going to get a bad outcome. We don't need to survey. We just kind of know from our, our research and our analysis. So let's go in and fix that. Let's figure out how to fix that as close to real time as possible so we can save that experience for that customer. I mean, as far as your most advanced clients at Forrester, are they using machine learning and other technology to, other technologies to be able to watch what's going on behind the scenes, kind of like the wizard behind the curtain in the Wizard of Oz? Like, like I feel like at this point, companies should know on the customer journey what's going on without the customer having to work so hard to tell them what's happening. Yeah, our more advanced clients are doing a lot of uh, behavioral predictive work. So they're also capturing at the end of an experience uh, information about their customer. You know, how often, you know, like I said, do they call in? How often are they uh, buying additional products, services? What have they upsell? You know, a, a bunch of behavioral data that they're now able to use and is actually a better measure than asking someone, how likely are you going to do something? We can look at, did they actually do something? And connecting that back up to that operational data. But to your point, what's what's um, surprising and, and you know, uh, to a certain degree, you know, uh, unfortunate is that there are, the companies are, are at all levels of maturity when it comes to measurement. And there are still some that are early on in the process and are still trying to figure out and understand where do I survey? Where do I get these inter internal metrics? The challenge sometimes is internally where the data also, uh, um, exists in different pockets and it's hard to connect them into you know, one overall data lake or one place to form those relationships and those connections. Mm -hmm. So again, lots of different levels of maturity that are, are making it more difficult to, for companies to mature quickly. You mentioned the word Pete, behavioral metrics or technologies can you just explain to our listeners who really are beginners like what does that look like okay so what that looks like is we think about uh, a couple different levels of measuring different types of metrics we start um i mentioned the operational metrics so that's uh, understanding what's happening in your organization you know the details around a website around a call average hold time things like that how many calls in a queue and then we have this category of what we call perception metrics. And that's any, ranging anything from anytime you're asking somebody, you know, rate us on this, how did this make you feel, anything, you know, it, it's getting that sense of perception. And so the first thing we do is we can link why did, how did somebody feel and what was going on with, you know, with that experience. The next step over is, so what do you intend to do or what's your overall feeling or, or reaction or outcome? So that's where we get into things like NPS or likelihood to redo, where we're asking the customer, based on your experiences, what are you likely to do? That's self-reported. People often don't do exactly what they say they're going to do. So that last step is looking at and capturing data of what your customers are actually doing. Loyalty programs are a great 
boost for for capturing that type of data. So you get to see how often somebody's coming in, or you know how often somebody's calling into the call center. So it's making the connection kind of between those two ends. I'm capturing information on what somebody actually did, and now I'm looking back and kind of going through these variables to say what happened in that interaction, and it's looking at those patterns that then help you to predict when this situation exists in the organization we see more behavior, better behavior from our customers. And so that helps you to design better experiences. Well, we're reaching the end of our formal interview time together before we get to know you with our rapid fire, but can we just close by talking about some of the new technologies that are trending you know, generative AI? Like what are you seeing and, and what is in the report about these topics? So I'll admit I'm not, you know, the, the expert on these technologies, but basically, you know, Gen AI, uh, chat GBT, things like that are, are, are taking the you know the the oxygen in the atmosphere now everybody's talking about them what there's certainly exciting work going on there from a cx perspective what we're recommending is to tread slowly don't jump into trying to adopt these technologies because there's still a lot to figure out on how CX leaders can use that technology. You know, it, right now we're seeing mostly that it's a supplement to the customer experience, such as you know using it to generate uh, chat dialogues or or to review a lot of uh, uh, open-ended text for for patterns. But it's not something that will be augmenting directly the customer experience for quite a while. So our recommendation there is to is to, again move slowly, look at things, start thinking about where that might uh, help support your your experience work and your initiatives, but don't jump in with both feet. And similarly with uh, um, uh, extended reality, which is the other big topic that we cover in the report, is that you know there was a lot of excitement about it a year or so ago. Not hasn't progressed that much. You know, we potentially see some connections for for CX, but now with uh, with Gen AI kind of popping its head up. It's, it's still just kind of sitting back there. So another technology that will continue, I think, to grow and be useful over time, but not to move too quickly into it uh, as we continue to figure out where, you know, how that's going to evolve and what that's going to mean. Extended reality. Is that like augmented reality and virtual reality? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's wearing the, the you know, the, the goggles and, and getting kind of a 3D experience. It's cool. I did a, I um, did a speech in uh, in virtual reality, it's cool, but I guess reality is better at this point. <laughs> Actual reality. <laughs> um, all right. Well, just like one closing line, like if you could give all of our customer experience practitioners and leaders one helpful, helpful tip looking to 2024, what is the number one thing if you could choose one that they should be focused on? I would say, you know, given kind of a level playing field, look to use your data more effectively look for those actions and focus on taking action on what you have available to again help prove your or demonstrate your value because now's a time where we really need to do that well i love it so great all right pete let's get to know you a little bit as a person ready for some rapid okay. fire let's go all right first what does your morning routine look like Morning routine, I wake up, lie in bed for a few minutes, kind of looking through social media. Then I uh, uh, get up. I have two dogs, two great Pyrenees, so they come first. I have to feed them, give them their meds, uh, put them outside. And then um, then I start taking care. I have breakfast, uh, catch up on some news in the morning, and then come up to my, uh, my office. I work remotely, so I'm here at home. All right. Do you have a unique leadership hack that helped get you to where you are today, Pete? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, I... I, I Studied, you know, many years ago a lot, of, a lot about leadership, and I would say probably the the uh, perspective that I agree most with, most most with is situational leadership. So, in a lot of different roles, I've learned to kind of adapt to the right situation and approach things the right situation, so or the, you know the right way. So I think it's that ability to kind of adapt to what's in front of me. And how do you relax at the end of a hectic day? So um, I enjoy reading. I'm actually, I also enjoy cross-stitching. So I usually will sit down in front of a TV and cross-stitch for a little while as, uh, as I'm watching, you know, catching up on some shows. Awesome. People love that. I really, my mom, I kind of learned how to do that. They're, they say it's so relaxing. <laughs> All right. What is your favorite leadership book or resource? Hard to answer because one of the things I've sometimes said is, you know, leadership is is so hard to define if it had been 
easy to define or easy to capture, we still wouldn't be seeing hundreds of books being published each year on how to be a good leader. Um, I would say, I know he's more in strategy, but I like Michael Porter's work, um, some of John Maxwell's work. I, you know, I can't say that there's one specific book that has you know, really resonated with me. Okay. What's your idea of perfect happiness? So I'll, I'll probably equate to or, or kind of mirror that to something I really enjoy doing, which is hiking. And uh, um, here in the Northeast, there's a lot of great mountain ranges in New Hampshire and Vermont. And when I was younger, I used to do a lot of backpacking up there. So I'd say for me, hi- uh, uh, happiness is the fall when it's a little bit crisper, cooler outside and being just in a nice, quiet mountaintop where you have great views and you're not surrounded by a lot of loud noises and people. If you had to describe your outlook in one quick motto, Pete, what would it be? Um, cautiously optimistic. Um, I tend to be a uh, pragmatist, and my wife would probably consider me a pessimist, somewhere in between there. But I, I try to you know, uh, look positively about things that are, are happening and stuff. But I've also you know, been around enough to realize that things don't always work out the way you want them to. So it's kind of like cautious optimism. maybe. Great. Well, it has been so interesting talking to you about this report. And if our audience wants to learn more about you or the report, do you have an easy way for them to do that? So I'm on LinkedIn, um, on X, but not as active there. Um, so certainly reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, certainly, if you're interested in learning more about what Forrester has to offer, uh, you know, talk to our teams about becoming a client. But um I'd say for for me directly, LinkedIn is is the easiest path. All right, Pete. Well, thank you. It's been so fun interviewing you. I hope you'll come back next year. We can see if your predictions came true for 2024. All of you have been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. Until next time. Uh